Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Victoria and I'm a Senior Business Development Coordinator at 2-H Offshore. Our webinar today is entitled Benefits, Risks, and Key Considerations of Offshore Driving. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few important housekeeping items. Firstly, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you soon, so please look out for a link to that in your email. Secondly, if you have technical or content related questions today, please feel free to ask them at any time. You can use the Q&A box that is located on the right hand side of your screen. At the end of the presentation, we will go through as many questions as we can, but if you have further questions, feel free to contact our speaker directly after the presentation. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Omar Kodir. Omar is a senior engineer at 2H Offshore in London. For the last three years, he has been assessing the driving performance of piles and conductors offshore with different hammers, geotechnical conditions, pipe connections, and empirical models. His work focuses on adequate modeling of hammer pile soil systems to reduce risks and improve the feasibility of driving as an installation mode. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Omar to get us started today. Great. Thank you very much for the warm introduction, Victoria. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk about a topic that is quite near and dear to my heart. I'm quite fascinated by soils and, and uh, the impact they have on the design of offshore assets. So um, I'll start the presentation with a quick introduction to driving, why we drive, when we typically drive. Um, then we will cover the basic anatomy of a driving system, the, the three major components that make up a driving system before we jump into understanding the risks that come with driving the soil, which is the governing more often than not governing uh, condition when it comes to uh, when to drive and when not to drive. Um, drivability analysis, which is the type of analysis used to manage the risks and understand the performance of a driving system, uh, and then how we can improve the feasibility before, during, and, and after driving, uh, and the best practices uh, to adopt before we wrap up. So. <clears throat> Why we drive and when we drive. Um, driving is really a, a very common uh, installation technique. It's used to install all sorts of offshore assets, oil and gas, all the way to renewables. We're talking well conductors, foundation piles, anchor piles, monopiles for offshore wind, floating, fixed. So it, it's really um, very, very commonly used. And the reason why it's commonly used is because if all goes well, it's it's very quick uh, and cost efficient. And it could be up to 67% faster than drilling and, and grouting. So for, for the case of a, of a, a an oil and gas platform, for instance, if you've got 18 to, to 10 slots, you can save um, a, a lot of drilling time. And so is the case if you're installing an offshore wind farm. Uh, if you can drive your foundations instead of drilling and cementing, you can really save a lot of time and, and save a lot of money. On the other hand, if things go wrong, uh, there will be costly remedial works and, and potentially well, definitely project delays because the, the, these um, uh, these risks, when they do happen, uh, they bring everything to a halt. So we, before we talk about these risks, let's quickly introduce the uh, the main or the major components of a driving system, beginning with the the hammer. Uh, the hammer could be hydraulic, it could be steam. They come in different sizes, different shapes, um, and really what it does, it, it drops a heavy weight onto a, a the pipe to deliver impact energy repeatedly. This heavy weight is called the ram. And the energy delivered to the pile or the pipe can be changed by changing the stroke, which is the distance traveled by the ram before impact for some hammers. Um, if you want to deliver more energy, you can increase the stroke or you can just go for a bigger hammer with a bigger ram. <clears throat> Second is the follower. Sometimes we don't want to directly impact the pile, uh, fearing that it might get damaged. So we use an intermediate connection that also comes in different types and flavors called the follower. <clears throat> and really the only function of the follower is to trans transmit the blow energy from the hammer to the pile and protect the pile from direct impact. 
Um, finally, the conductor or the pile itself, which is the pipe that we would like to install, it could be made up of a single pipe joint or multiple pipe joints, and it could also use a drive shoe, which is a very small um, joint, sacrificial joint, uh, that is installed or welded at the bottom, at the toe of the pile, to again protect the pile from the, um, the impacts that it's, it, uh, it's seeing due to hammering. <clears throat> and also it can provide some um, efficiencies when it comes to in, uh, driving the, the, the pile, um, which is something that we will discuss briefly in a few slides. So in terms of the risks that come with, um, with driving, there are a few, but the biggest one by far is refusal. Refusal is an unacceptable risk when it comes to driving, and it's really the... Uh, it's, quantif it's a quantifiable risk. It is um, when the blow count exceeds 250 to 300 blows per quarter meter. So as we deliver um, hammer blows, we expect that w the pipe penetrates the soil. <clears throat> if we're delivering up to 250 to 300 blows and we're getting less than a, a quarter meter of, a pen of penetration or less, then we have we have reached refusal and then we really risk damaging the hammer damaging the pile and not and and also delaying the project uh, it's futile uh, continuing the drive operation at this point um, it also invalidates some of the warranties on on the hammers um, so it it's it's usually unacceptable it's always unacceptable we try to um, manage this risk and avoid it at all costs when we're planning for driving. <clears throat> when you achieve refusal, when you hit refusal, then uh, very costly remedial action is needed because you, you're, you're offshore, you've got a hammer, you, you, don't expect, you expect everything to go smoothly and the, and the pile to be installed, but then you, you bring everything to a halt and you need to mobilize additional crew, additional equipment to perhaps drill through the, the pipe and remove the soil plug or even drill uh, an undersized or oversized hole ahead of the pile tip to facilitate further driving. So it's, it's really costly and, and that's why it's, it's usually unacceptable. We have other risks, but these also can be um, managed during the, the planning stage. Uh, one risk is drop folds. Um, it's when the pipe goes through a, a zone of low resistance and suddenly it, it drops very, very quickly. Fatigue damage of the pile, as we're hammering the pile, we're accumulating fatigue damage, so it's essential that driving fatigue damage is assessed and, and also buckling of pile tip, which could happen in challenging soils. Um, and it's something that could be assessed, uh, but then it, it's going to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis or the need for it to be assessed. Now, to, to really um, manage the, the, the risks that we just uh, discussed, we need to understand soils and, and their function. So a quick introduction, soils, they, they provide lateral and axial support to all offshore structures. And um, axial support is provided by two main components. Skin friction, which is the action of uh, soil uh, friction against the, the pile wall uh, inside and outside and end bearing, which is the resistance provided by the soil that is in, um, in contact with the, with the tip of the, of the pile. Now, this support is resistance if it's not helping, if it's working against us. And this is really what soil resistance to driving is. As we're driving, as we attempt to install the, the, the pipe, um, soil resistance to driving is, is working against us and it's really the axial capacity of the soil but with a, with a small twist. So what is axial capacity? Just to recap, axial capacity is how much weight the soil can support axially. It's also known as bearing capacity or long-term static resistance. This drives the length and target depth for axially loaded structures. It's really important to assess the axial capacity whenever um, a, the, the foundation, to, during a, a, the foundation engineering phase. <clears throat> um, 
and as I said, yes, uh, the axis capacity and target depth, it must be sufficient to support the design load. And that's why you, you, we need to go through the exercise of estimating the axis capacity, compare, applying an appropriate safety factor, and comparing it to the design load. <clears throat> now, it might help the case for driving to assess the axle capacity. Sometimes um, operators or um, project owners and asset owners, they, they just recycle designs. But when it comes to you know, building a, a, a new uh, offshore platform or, or installing a new wind farm, the, the, the soil conditions are different. And then your target depth could be different. And in fact, it will be different because the axle capacity provided by your soil is, is different. And with that, the, sto the, the soil resistance to driving so moving on to soil resistance to driving, which is really the axle capacity working against us. It is the axle capacity, but it's the weakened axle capacity working against our conductor slash pile. Why weakened? It's because while driving, we, we weakened the soil and we'll see that in, in a second. We can estimate the long-term static resistance um, and then estimate the soil resistance to driving if we can quantify the amount, the weakening effect um, that, we, uh, that we observe offshore. <clears throat> Alternatively, we can estimate the soil resistance to driving using one of the um, uh, established empirical methods, um, such as Stevens, Alman Hamry, or Puke uh, methods. These are uh, methods that have been developed and calibrated based on driven piles offshore in different ge geographical locations. So they're not always um, accurate. In fact, they're, they're, they're never accurate, but the, the aim of the exercise is not to be accurate, it's, it's to be conservative. And then I say end bearing is always considered in static resistance to driving because um, it's not always considered when calculating axial axial capacities. But when it comes to estimating the soil resistance to driving, we always have to consider the end bearing resistance. And, and actually the end bearing resistance can come in two flavors when driving. It, um, it could come in the form shown in A, which is a plugged condition where the um, so, where, the, where a soil plug has has formed and it's moving with the pile as you're hammering, and so the end bearing uh, resistance is acting across the entire cross section of your pipe. Or it can happen as shown in B, which is the unplugged condition or the coring condition, where the end bearing resistance is only acting along the uh, annulus uh, or the annular area. And um, uh, this is because the, the soil has not plugged. And in fact, as you're hammering, the pile or the pipe is cutting through the soil in a, in a cookie cutter fashion. And then you end up with internal skin friction and only end bearing acting on the annulus. So when it comes to estimating the soil resistance to driving, sometimes we, uh, we need to either assess whether plugging is going to happen or not, or we can uh, bound the problem and look at plugged conditions and unplugged conditions um, to, to uh, deal with this uncertainty. But in actuality, the, the pipe will plug and unplug multiple times depending on its size um, as you drive. So it's really somewhere that's not even in the middle, it's somewhere um, that is bounded by assessing these two conditions. Um, Again, so before we talk about how we can quantify the weakening effects of the soil while driving, we can talk about difficult soils. Um, and I say that because feasibility of driving is really soil dependent, as I said. And if you have challenging soils or if you've got difficult soils or soils that are not very uh, welcoming to, to driving, then driving is not an option. Uh, and I think it's easier to know when not to drive than when uh, when to drive. Um, these are the conditions or the, the types of soils where it's futile to even consider um, driving. I think competent rocks where you've got uh, compressive strengths higher than 3 MPA or even 2.5 MPA, um, and by competent I mean um, high, high RQDs, rock quality designations. Very hard clays, um, so very stiff to hard clays, 
500 kpa plus shear strength again these prove to be very very difficult uh, difficult soils in fact as this the clays become stiffer the the driving becomes uh, more and more difficult and you end up having to go for bigger hammers and finally, uh, calcareous and cemented soils. And the reason why we don't drive in these uh, in these soils is not because we risk refusing and we risk uh, failing to reach the target depth. It's actually because when driving in these soils, uh, we end up with very poor adhesion with the pile wall. And, and so the axle capacities that we have estimated, uh, we cannot rely upon. Uh, so it's much better to drill and cement in these soils, uh, soil conditions to ensure that the axle capacities that we we need are, are, uh, are achieved. Now, I believe that anything else may be feasible, but with trade-offs and, and with a bit of engineering. So uh, we can use bigger hammers if the clays get stiffer, but then we introduce higher stresses and we may need bigger or thicker pipes. We can use drive drill drive operations, which um, you end up you know, spending more time offshore. You drive a little bit. And when you reach refusal, you drill, and then you continue driving. Um, so again, it's more time than driving, but it's less time than than drilling. Um, and so it, it is an option, and sometimes it's something that we that we use to uh, drive and reach target depths in, in in challenging soils. We can we can make use of the drive shoe design. Now the benefits are hard to quantify. Uh, usually drive shoes they would have an internal upset, i.e. they would have a slightly larger wall thickness compared to the pile itself. And what that does, it reduces the internal um, skin friction a little bit. But by how much, it's hard to quantify, and that's why we say benefits hard to quantify. Unless of course it's a close-ended drive shoe, which ensures that you're driving at plugged conditions all. The time reducing your soil re resistance to driving, but then you have to think about drilling through it if um, you're drilling a well, for instance. But if uh, if you are installing offshore anchors for, uh, or mooring anchors, then uh, they could be a, a very good option to consider. However, they will reduce the axle capacity because you can no longer rely on the internal skin friction when it comes to your uh, estimating your axle capacity. So again, trade-offs. Also, we can we can select the connectors appropriately if we're looking at um, piles made up of different or multiple joints. And uh, the the challenge here sometimes or usually the the connectors are already selected or uh, are are with the with the with the operator and they would like to use them because they have them in stock. They bought them a couple of years ago and they want to use them. Uh, but if if we are at a stage where we're planning for a new project, we have the liberty to choose the connector. Then selecting the connector appropriately can help the case for driving and I'll explain uh, that in a bit more detail I like this uh, as, as a rule of thumb the stiffer the clay and the deeper the target depth the, the bigger the hammer the denser the sands and the deeper the dark the target depth the, the bigger the hammer it's usually the case but um, sometimes you, you can also accommodate by a combination of these these options and and avoiding a bigger hammer altogether sometimes now we reach a, a very interesting phenomenon i think which is the the phenomenon of of pile so, uh, or soil setup pile soil setup setup is is a is the phenomenon of in, an increase in skin friction over time and this is really due to the weakening effects of of driving as uh, it, it could that effect could be up to 400 percent after driving we can see up to a 400 percent increase in the skin friction and it could be very very low with other installation methods up to three up to five percent now the reason why is the more you you disturb the soil during installation the more you weaken the soil uh, because the soils they uh, kind of accommodate the the, the temporary uh, loading and unloading via a, a very temporary increase in in poor water pressure and with an increase in poor water pressure you end up with um, a weaker interparticle uh, forces between between the actual grains but then the pressures subside and and actually the uh, while they're subsiding the grains they tight up even closer and you end up with a consolidation effect and and a strengthening of of the soils um and 
we call the, the, the phenomena of weakening the soil during driving friction fatigue. So as you drive, you're weakening the soil, there's friction fatigue. After you drive, the soil regains its, its, its strength and that soil setup. Now, we, we can't really consider friction fatigue if, if we're talking about welded joints. The reason why it's because it will take you a few hours to weld the joints offshore, maybe up to eight hours if you're doing some heat treatment. And, you know, f four to eight hours, that's enough time for, s for the soil to regain some of its strength. Now, it's not full setup because full setup can happen over a period of three to six months, but it is some setup. And it's hard to quantify how much is that setup. So it's it's prudent and conservative to ignore the the effect of friction fatigue altogether. However, if we can if we can avoid welding joints and instead we have some quick makeup connectors, as as we'll see, then we can incorporate this effect with more confidence. And I, I, that's what I'm that's what I mean with. Uh, <clears throat> with being conservative, by default, we would consider the full soil strength during driving for the feasibility assessments uh, as 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 a standard. Um, but then we can refine this if we know that we won't have long pauses in in our driving operation. And also, in, uh, making up joints is not the only um, the only thing that can cause pauses in driving, as we'll see in in a in a slide or two. So talking about drivability analysis for a little bit, we do need some uh, data to do a, a, a sound drivability analysis and, and that data is really geotechnical data. So it's, it's very important, it's crucial that for any new soil, uh, for any new location where we're looking to install a, a platform or a wind farm, we do uh, geotechnical surveys, um, adequate geotechnical surveys. So we, we would review the data provided by the, <clears throat> by the surveyor the pile data, the connector data, then we will develop our soil resistance to driving that would be based on one of the empirical me methods that I have, I have presented. Um, and then we would use a drivability analysis software uh, to model the pile, select the hammer, um, input the developed SRD model, and then uh, also input the hammer operating profile. As I said, you can vary the stroke if, you, if you'd like, so you can control how much energy input you you would like to um, <clears throat> to um, to use and that is something that we can simulate as well finally we can do the driving fatigue calculation by extracting the stress histograms from the drivability analysis and use the fatigue details from the connector and the fatigue details of the pipe to uh, quantify the fatigue damage accumulated during driving now, as I said before, refusal is an acceptable risk, so we, we tend to use a conservative approach at the early stages of the project when we are assessing the feasibility of driving and the feasibility of using a specific hammer. And uh, these uh, uh, conservative assumptions are as follows. We ignore friction fatigue and we ignore the benefits of drive shoes. Now, if you can drive with these assumptions, if the analysis shows that driving is feasible, then it's really um, it's really straightforward, and there's no concerns. You'd need to also uh, consider your driving fatigue and fatigue coming from other parts of or other stages uh, in in your operating life cycle. But uh, when it comes to driving, it should be not uh, it shouldn't be a problem. However, if it is shown to be uh, not feasible, then we can look into refining the entire approach and, and, and uh, um, improve the SRD model as I'll show in the next slide, but uh, it needs to know, everyone needs to know that it takes more time. Um, the reason why is because, for instance, to include the friction fatigue effects, we, we would need the compenetration uh, test data, which um, are raw data coming from the from the geotechnical survey so it takes a, a bit of time um, setting up a, a, an SRD model that incorporates friction fatigue effects so this is how we would go about perhaps refining the um, the analysis um, not only before driving but potentially after driving if we have a drive log 
for the uh, the location or in a very nearby location. Uh, now we can use the drive lock to actually calibrate our SRD. So you can forget about the empirical method. We have data from the site. We can use it to refine our SRD and actually get much closer to the actual soil resistance to driving that we would see offshore. And then we would repeat the process of modeling the pile, selecting the hammer, etc., etc. Now this eliminates the uncertainty um, that we would typically have to deal with when we're talking about the uh, setup and the friction fatigue effects because we don't have to estimate okay how much the soil is going to lose in terms of strength and how much the soil is going to gain later um, and it reduces the conservatism in the analysis greatly. This is very good for predicting the driving fatigue. Now, it might not be very useful for uh, assessing the feasibility of driving because if you've driven at that location before successfully, you know you can drive again. It's, it's more about quantifying the driving fatigue damage and then combining that with other sources of that, uh, fatigue damage uh, during the uh, operating life of the asset and making sure that it, it, it all works, it, it all checks out. <clears throat> So now we can talk about improving the feasibility uh, of driving during the planning stage. And I'll, I'll just go over some of the uh, items I, I brought up before and perhaps two uh, new items. First is the connector selection. We, the quick makeup connectors, they allow us to incorporate friction fatigue effects into the SRD model with more confidence. If we know that the, um, the, the driving operation would be paused for a couple of hours because we need to weld joints, we cannot really incorporate the friction fatigue effect um, in, in our assessment. Secondly, connectors with optimized driving performance, they give low driving fatigue damage. Sometimes driving fatigue damage is the limiting uh, performance and we end up accumulating w w uh, high fatigue in the connectors um, and and so selecting a, a uh, connector that has optimized driving performance really helps but in case you, you don't select these uh, connectors and you select another connector then actually connectors with an external upset they have a positive effect of skin, on skin friction because they act in a similar way uh, compared to the uh, the drive through with an upset they move some of this the soil away from the from the pipe which really reduces your external skin friction a little bit Another thing is to interrogate the target depth and, and assess the axle capacity. Um, sometimes oil and gas wells, so the, cementing the surface casing the, to the conductor contributes significantly to the axle capacity. So you don't really need to uh, have a deep target depth for, for the conductor, which allows you to save money on the installation and save money on the, uh, the, the length of joint and the number of joints needed. Um, and also is the case for uh, foundations and anchoring, it's always good to estimate the axle capacity and engineer the foundations accordingly. Um, so that applies for renewables to, to some extent, but you have nothing to cement the anchor to, you just need to optimize the length of, of the pile accordingly. And finally, as I said, adequate geotechnical surveys are, are paramount. To, uh, to the planning of any, any new project. Um, it, they, it reduces risk and it enables foundations to be optimized and engineered. And that, and that could lead to reduced installation times, uh, especially if, if driving is feasible. And it might seem uh, very um, intuitive, but we, we actually have seen um, some, uh, let's say, contractors who who downplay the, the, the importance of having, you know, geotechnical surveys performed at the location of the asset, which is, which is uh, a, a bit mad, uh, to be honest. And then being there early enough when it comes to, uh, when it comes to planning for a new asset. Uh, the earlier you are, the more freedom you have with the design, and then you can really um, uh, effect, uh, 
change the pile design to facilitate driving. So for instance, you can see, um, which is counterintuitive as well, a thicker pile, so that's more steel weight, and you're actually uh, spending more on a pile, might m render driving feasible uh, because you've in reduced your internal skin friction, and with that you save a lot more money on installation and offshore time. So it's, it's good to be there early and to consider these items early. On the field, there are actions that can be done to also ensure a successful driving operation. Um, first of all, is to avoid intermediate stops, as I said, because we would like to avoid soil setup. Um, so for that, hydraulic hammers are more reliable than diesel. As I said, it's not just the welding of joints that can lead to pauses. The type of hammer can lead to pauses as well. Hydraulic hammers are very reliable. Diesel hammers, they can, they can stop. They can stop on you, give up on you, and, and, and uh, lead to unwanted pauses during driving. Also, another counterintuitive uh, item is to uh, drive at lower energies and higher blow counts. Uh, we often see that hammer operators, they would like to get in, the, get in there, whack the pile as hard as they can, drive it, get, get it out of the way. But actually, um, if we drive at lower energies and higher blow counts, some, somewhere around 100 blows per quarter meter, um, then we accumulate less fatigue damage because the stress ranges are much smaller for lower energy inputs. We weaken the soil even more because of the number of cycles that the, the, the soil sees in terms of loading and unloading compared to a fast drive operation. And it's also prudent to avoid drop falls in low resistance layers. Um, so if you go through a low resistance zone and you're driving at high energies, then you can really uh, have a very uh, substantial drop uh, that cannot be controlled or contained. And then if we're striking, then it's, it's okay to increase the, the hammer energy input, of course, because we expect the soil to have gain, regain some of its strength. Finally, it's really good to use pile monitoring to measure soil resistance to driving because then it, it provides insight for future projects and, uh, uh, and also it provides a really good a set of data for the engineers to perhaps recalculate the driving fatigue and refine their estimates if they would like to do some life extension work, for instance. Now, post-driving, there are some actions that can also improve feasibility post-driving. First would be keeping the drive logs and, and the soil reports. This is really important because nothing is better than having documented experience of driving near site. It really provides unparalleled insight into the soils and how, um, how much resistance they can, they can offer. Uh, the drive log on its own is not really a great help. We also need to know what type of soils we have out there and what type of strengths. Um, the reason why is because together, when you have a drive log and a soil report for a given location and a soil report for another location, then we can compare the types of soils, we can compare the stratas, we can ascertain whether the soils are actually similar in terms of composition types and strengths, and if we can reuse the drive log to kind of uh, build our soil resistance to driving model and do our drivability assessments. So geotechnical surveys at the new site are still necessary. It does not negate their need. And the plot shown on the right really shows uh, the blow count, the actual blow count for a number of offshore uh, assets compared to the um, uh, the analysis expectations in black. And you can see that we're, we're, we're Sometimes we're way off, so the, our our lowest estimate from the analysis is is quite far from the um, the actual uh, blow count that we see offshore. Now this could be, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you can if you will rule out driving because the analysis is telling you you're going to refuse early, while in actuality you will not, then you 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 have missed on an opportunity to save a lot of money. And then repeating the driving fatigue analysis using calibrated SRDs to refine fatigue life margins. That is really useful and something that can come in um, in the future as well if you'd like to extend the life of an asset or what, what can we do. Fatigue is really an issue and we've got corrosion on, on top of it now. Um, and, and then 
revisiting the driving fatigue accumulated uh, then would, would, would be uh, beneficial. That's all I have to share with you today. To quickly wrap up, I'll just go, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but I'll basically just summarize again what we've done. Driving is fast, it's efficient, it comes with risks that need to be managed, and I have shared with you the best practices to manage those risks and mitigate them, and it, it begins with an adequate geotechnical survey. It also uh, resists the urge to recycle designs without reassessing target depths and, and the hammers and the pile design, etc., because then you can introduce cost savings due to a new location that weren't possible at the old location. Um, and uh, keeping record of everything, really, the past driving experience, the drive logs, the soil reports, that will help the planning of future assets, especially if they're not far away from, from the existing assets. And finally, do the foundations engineering do the drivability, the driving fatigue, the axle capacity assessments, do it all uh, using good data, uh, using all the data that's available, and that would really help improve the feasibility of, of driving. I hope that was useful. I'm done, Victoria. I hope I haven't gone uh, over, over the 30-minute mark. Hi, Omar. Yeah, you're good. Um, we have time for questions, so I'll get started asking the ones that have come in, and then if anyone else has any more, just go ahead and send them in the Q&A box, and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, okay, so the first one, um, can we drive sub-C? Um, yes, it depends on the type of the hammer. Um, so diesel hammers, uh, they are only used for surface driving. They cannot be used for subsea driving. But um, uh, hydraulic hammers, the ones made by IHC, uh, hi the hydro hammers, the ones made, some, some of the MENG hammers, they can be used to drive subsea. They do come with um, some accessories um, to uh, make that uh, happen, but it is possible. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next one. Could you please share any example problem or the reference material to estimate SRD and how to select a hammer? So, reference problem. How to select a hammer? Let me, let me answer the second question uh, first. How to select a hammer begins with the drivability analysis. So, um, the aim of the drivability analysis is not just to confirm whether driving is feasible, but it's also to confirm that the hammer is appropriately sized, um, right? But then it comes with experience. Uh, the more you work with driving, the more you can get a feel for the type of energy input needed to reach a specific target depth given uh, a, a soil resistance to driving. Um, and in terms of the reference problems, I think the papers published by, they're not published, they're, they're OTC paper. Uh, the Stevens paper is a really good reference to understand the work that he has done and developing his own method for uh, estimating SRD. I think that's a really good starting point. Um, and also the um, the API recommended practice um, uh, 2A, I think, for platforms. Is it 2A or 2RD? 2A, working stress design. There is um, a section on driving um, and foundation engineering. Um, so together with the Stevens paper, they, pro they, they work together to provide a good understanding of how we estimate axle capacities, um, how the uh, SRD is a bit different, and then how we can um, uh, use them to assess the feasibility of driving and using a specific hammer. Okay, great. Um, the next one is, how do you access lateral capacity? The, the way you would assess lateral capacity, and it's not really, uh, I mean, it, it, it would influence your um, target depth if you are, have laterally loaded piles, is using um, a, a beam on a Winkler foundation model. So you would develop your, um, you'd need PY springs, uh, and the, the PY is really the pressure deflection springs that describe how much lateral resistance you get from the soil, the more you uh, displace into the soil. Um, and then there are many, many methods to use to develop these, these PY curves. Um, uh, the standard is to use 
our standard is to use API, the API method, which is again, it's, it's, it's uh, described in the API recommended practice to GEO. Um, it, it describes how to develop the uh, PY curves for clays, for sands, rocks are a bit different. So you'd need to develop these PY curves and then you would need to, um, probably you would need a finite element uh, analysis package to model a, a pipe with these, with these uh, springs as your boundary condition and also the lateral load that you've got uh, along the pile um, and see, uh, and from that assessment, and it doesn't need to be anything fancy, it's, it's just a static assessment. You will get the deflections along the pile, the bending moments along the pile, and from it the bending stresses along the pile as well. Um, but it's it's really, I would say it's a, it's different to driving. Uh, it's a different type of assessment. So driving is all about the axial loading because the hammer also provides uh, energy inputs uh, in the axial direction and axial stresses are induced but the lateral kind of the, um, the laterally loaded pile and the design of laterally loaded piles they can be driven um, but you'd look at the lateral performance of the soil and the pile separate uh, to the axial performance due to driving and the axial load on it. Okay thank you. Um, the next one is is tip resistance affected by setup or is it only the shaft resistance that is increased during the setup process? That's a really good question and, and it is just the skin friction. The end bearing is not affected at all by setup. Okay, thank you. And then the next one is what software is available to perform estimate? Okay, what software is available to perform the estimate of depth to achieve the required axial capacity? You don't have to use software. Uh, some of the methods are actually easily implemented in a, in, in a spreadsheet. Again, the API, they have, uh, uh, I mean, the alpha method used for clays and the beta, me with, uh, and the beta method used for uh, sands, they are described in API RP2Geo, and you can implement them in uh, a spreadsheet quite easily. Um, also, you can use, uh, single pile analysis software such as Opile um, to calculate, to have access to more methods. So this is just one method, but uh, actually when it comes to axial capacity, alpha method is, is all about estimating an adhesion factor. Um, and the different methods, all they do is they have slightly different um, ways of calculating or estimating this adhesion factor. So really all you're doing is changing the calculation of of uh, of your adhesion factor when it comes to uh, selecting a different method but um opile is, is a good software to use has lots of methods think... in there okay awesome thank you um next one what can be done to mitigate the risks of refusal in terms of planning and offshore re remediation so before driving or after driving if before driving then we we would really need to uh, make sure that we were conservative enough uh, or our models are representative enough of the soil location and the pile and the pile system that we've got um, and with that we can really eliminate the so the, the risk of refusal um, but if if it does happen that per perhaps we did not have good enough data or we used the wrong data we made a m modeling error during the planning stage and now we're planning mitigations before driving um, just in case we did reach refusal we will need to have some uh, drilling spread uh, available to us because we the remedial work would really be um, mainly drilling through the, the pipe and and clearing the soil plug and potentially drilling ahead of the pipe or but that's not that's not really used often because that's a lot more work and perhaps a lot more delays is to cut the pile, the, the pile and we and install a smaller pile within it or a smaller conductor within it either driven or drilled but then just cutting and 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 procuring or a smaller pipe would would, would be would cost us a lot more money and would lead to a lot more delay. So it's really just drilling and having a drilling spread available um, uh, to uh, to drill through the pile when when refusal does happen. 
Okay, thanks. Um, let's, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, what could be done to avoid pile run slash free fall? So with with the free falls, there are usually first of all that's a risk that is managed and mitigated by the hammer uh, supplier, and what they would do is that they would have pad eyes on the hammer or on the follower, um, and uh, these pad eyes they have to be sized appropriately for the risk of free fall, so that the they you've got slings or you've got chains holding these pad eyes as you're driving there's they're they're not taut and if free fall or drop falls happen then they would uh, come in to hold everything in place and make sure that you don't end up with with uh, a big problem um i have seen once before that the pad eyes failed uh, luckily the, the the drop fall wasn't very severe um, and and it was a lesson learned for the operator to just upsize the pad eyes. That, that's literally it. Perfect. Um, and then the last one, could you, would you mind repeating um, what that OTC paper title and the year was that you mentioned regarding the SRD and hammer selection? Um, I cannot remember off the top of my head, but I'm happy to dig it out for whoever wants it um uh, the, the, yeah, the that, name the, the yeah no i was gonna say um for everyone on the call um you can see omar's um contact details here and if you would like further clarification especially for the person that asked about the otc paper title and the api codes uh please feel free to contact him and um he can look more into that for you and give more information uh, specifically to what you know you're trying to find out so um, that would be great, if you don't mind that, Omar. Nah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I prefer it, actually, because then I can dig it out. I'll provide the title and perhaps dig out maybe more references that would be beneficial um, uh, to wh whoever's interested. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Omar, for all the information on this topic. That's all the time that we have for today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if we didn't get to your question or if you guys would like to continue the discussion, you can contact Omar directly using these details provided here. Thank you to our audience for your time and participation. We hope you all found this useful and will join us for more webinars in this series happening once a month. You can check out 2H's LinkedIn page for more details and to sign up. And again, please look out for the recording of this webinar in your email in the next 24 hours. And we hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. And thank you. Thank you all.